given that it's 10 years since the uh, referendum, we've just pulled this together to have a quick conversation about 10 years on, what that referendum can tell us, what's next for um, Scottish politics and how the last 10 years have metabolised that debate and movement and what it's turned into and what that can tell us about Scottish culture and um, Scottish political culture particularly now. Can I have you both introduce yourselves? Um, so over to you, Esther, first. Hi, I'm Esther Roberton. I was the former coordinator of the Scottish Constitutional C Convention that helped set up the Parliament and I suspect I would be described as someone who's been campaigning for democracy ever since. Mm -hmm. I'm Jonathan Sharfey. I was a campaigner for independence um, during the referendum and in that period of time I co-founded the Radical Independence Campaign. Thanks both. Um, I'm Lena. I'm from the Compass Office. Um, I was 16 at the time of the Scottish Independence <laughs> Referendum campaign um, and so I remember it from that perspective. I'm going to start off by just asking like what was your experience of the referendum? It doesn't have to be the day but that period and, and are there any particular moments that stand out to you both? And maybe I'll go to Jonathan first. Well for me the, the referendum was a hugely exciting time um, it's dare I say probably one of the the best uh, couple of years in in my life, <laughs> um, uh, because of the the possibilities and the potential that I I felt existed uh, politically. I mean, I came into the referendum period around twenty twelve um, as someone who had never once a uh, campaigned before on the question of independence. This is something that really wasn't on my political radar. I was far more interested in a range of other issues. I'd done a lot around things like austerity, for example. Uh, and here was this opportunity to have a broad ranging discussion about what the future of our country should look like. And that to me was hugely exciting, uh, as I say, full of potential and um, met so many people throughout it that I'm still in touch with today. And yeah, I think we made a, a really good, a really good fist of it as well and put on some some great events and, and, and was part of what I think was a an exceptionally uh, diverse uh, movement of people, um, many of which involved for the first time and uh, it's something I look back on fondly. Yeah. Esther, does that ring true with you? I don't think I can really explain other than say that I wasn't directly involved in the campaign at all. I was much more an observer. Um, but what was interesting for me was observing it through the eyes of my two sons, who at that point were just coming up for 16. So he ended up just being too young to vote. And his big brother, who by the time of the vote had just turned 20, he was about to leave home and go to college, but was still in that phase where on a Friday night, the boys would come round for please, as they used to call them, for a drink or two before they used to go out on a Friday night. And I had brought home... Um, the prospectus from Scottish Government. I'd picked up a few copies in St Andrew's House and I found Stephen's copy lying on his bedroom floor, you know, 19 year old, bit of a mess, where the boys would congregate. And it looked pretty tatty. And I said, I take it that means you've read it. And he said, yeah, absolutely. I said, so can I have it for somebody else? No. I said, why not? He said, because you might think we just sit in here and drink and talk about football. We're talking about this document. And I think that kind of little anecdote kind of encapsulated for me the general atmosphere and the excitement for me was the engagement from both sides and the turnout you know way exceeded the turnout in the referendum in 97 way beyond anything we ever get in, in any other kind of election and on reflection now it is about suddenly people felt they had direct power and direct say over what was going to happen to them and for me, looking back over these 10 years, I think that's what the subject's really about. I'm really sad that it's become such a binary issue and it's do dominated the conversation as much as it has. Because what I want to see is that level of engagement in Scotland's future, whatever people decide it's going to be. Um, and, you know, that generation, to me, were hugely engaged, as, as Chaffee says. But actually, are they engaged now? Probably not. Have they any interest in local democracy? We've been launched a campaign recently that says if we're serious about democracy, then it needs to start locally and it needs to mean something important for people's day-to-day -day lives. Um, and I don't think either of my sons or their friends are in any way engaged in that political debate at all. So I think we've lost something. And I do think it's about power and a sense of my vote counted then 
so I did it. Um, and I don't think my vote... I was going to say I don't think my vote counts elsewhere. That shouldn't be true. With a PR system in the Parliament and in local government, it should. But I don't think it does. And one of the things I've always been astonished by, given the role I had in helping secure the Parliament, was that we got such a great turnout, not as good as 14, in 97 in the referendum. We've never matched that in terms of elections. People turned out to vote for it and now don't vote in it, if you see what I mean. And that's a worrying thing about our democracy as well. We wanted it, but we don't feel strongly enough to get out and vote for who's in it. You know. So, so I think there was something wonderful that has been lost. I know from friends on the no side, um, a number of them had unpleasant experiences. I would imagine friends on the yes side had the same. But my sense was of something lively, enthusiastic, joyful, and a lot of it driven by culture, actually. Um, I know, you know, the, the National Collective did all sorts of amazing things. And I think we've lost that cultural bit as well, um, mm -hmm. partly, frankly, because of the cost of living crisis, meaning our cultural sector struggling. Yeah. But overall, I thought it was a really positive thing. Um, and people felt they had a choice that made a difference. Yeah. And I remember going to town halls as a as a person in school that they held specifically for 16 and 17 year olds. Mm -hmm. And those weren't always pleasant experiences and quite a lot of them were filled with uh, interactions that were coloured by a certain kind of uh, uh, entitlement and like why a 16 year old or a 17 year old was asking you a politician or someone as a, as a professor oh, really? questions. But also like, the engagement, you're absolutely right. I remember taking the last train home one night from Edinburgh and, you know, it stops at every station and everybody's getting in and getting out and everyone's talking about independence. And at the end of the day, they all kind of shook their hands, shook each other's hands as they got off the train. So I remember the kind of both sides of that experience as it being something that people were deeply engaged with, sometimes in a way that wasn't so pleasant but that everybody wanted to take seriously and wanted to talk about in a way that hasn't happened since. And I don't think happened in the rest of the UK yeah. in the same way at any other occasion. Um, I don't know if that resonates, uh, Jonathan, do you, what, what, yeah, what does that moment of the referendum feel like 10 years later? And how do, how do you think you've processed that? Well, one of the, through the radical independence campaign, you know, what we were trying to do was to inject um, some wider politics into the constitutional debate. Um, but one of the other elements that we took up in, in a big way was looking at this question of voter registration. Mm -hmm. Because our reckoning was that there was a huge number of people that weren't on the voters roll, that rarely took part in elections, but might well uh, cast a vote in terms of this referendum on, on independence. So we conducted a, a lot of outreach and, and, you know, we did a lot of things where sometimes it just was, you know, signing people to up to vote. And I remember, you know, getting a call from one of the activists involved um, who'd set up a stall in his, his local community and he had people queuing up. Wow. And uh, he he phoned up, actually quite emotional at this because he'd someone who'd been a long time community activist and kind of struggled to get people involved in things. And here was this, you know, people flocking towards his stall signing people up to vote, of course, giving the arguments that we were putting out at the time about how Scotland could be different, how we could do things better, uh, and that sort of thing. So, you know, that kind of hope that I think people mm -hmm. had um, is very important. Um, I think it's that hope which the SNP managed to capitalise on after the no vote, that here was a possibility of extending that feeling of agency that you had, that feeling of hope, vicariously through the SNP, but of course, that in the end was a very difficult kind of formulation. And one of the things that does worry me looking back is that people feel that they don't have hope, mm -hmm. that there is moralisation, that there is a deepening sense of, of alienation between people and politics and, and institutions. Um, and so we have to think about that today, I think, uh, and draw some of the, the best sort of spirit of, of the referendum a, a, into into a new into a new political reality. There's a really important point in there which probably neither of you are old enough to remember. But in the 80s, when Mrs. Thatcher was in power, she talked a lot about the dependency culture in Scotland. And I was involved in economic development and in enterprise education and all sorts of things. And I used to be absolutely raging. How dare she? 
till I sat and thought about it and thought, in a way, she's absolutely right. Because under the Thatcher government, Scotland could say what it liked, but Westminster decided. And if we wanted something and she didn't, she said no. And that was the end of it. Now, obviously, the 97 referendum would moved on a bit from that, but we wouldn't have if she'd still been in power or the Conservatives had still been in power. And in a way, I think that's really a follow on from what you're saying, Jonathan. I think that hopelessness is about the fact that whatever you want in Scotland, if we've got parties in Westminster saying you're not getting to have a choice, that's mm. coercive control of the worst kind and is in itself completely disempowering. And if, if Westminster, and that's not a party political comment, were really confident they would be saying to Scotland and to Wales and Northern Ireland, and obviously the Northern Ireland situation is different, we think the union is the right thing, but we want you to be part of it, you know, to use all the language that was around in 2014 of equal partners. I don't feel like an equal partner at all, even under our new government that was supposed to give us hope. I feel mm -hmm. like we're told to be in our box, um, you know, and that's not going to empower people or engage, especially not the younger people. Why would they engage if they think Westminster's going to say no? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I guess one of the questions that I wanted to talk about was what were the moments of 2014 um, that gave you hope and how is that hope fading 10 years mm -hmm. later? And I think that you've both kind of beautifully covered it there that no, both sides of the debate, and I've seen a lot of coverage this week, particularly from more staunch no sides of the debate that talked about the relief, you know, the, the kind of lack of hope, this fear leading up to the independence referendum. Um, and I think that, you know, as somebody that was there, that didn't really, that wasn't really what I felt. And again, yeah. um, that it's anecdotal, but the, it was it was a sense of let's take this question seriously and we'll see where we land on different issues and we'll see. And it was a deeply hopeful conversation because it took those questions seriously, because it wanted to seriously take on what uh, independence could mean to people and how it could change Scotland. Um, but yeah, how do you how do you see that hope fading in 2024 and, and beyond? I think one of the things about 2014, which the Labour Party misjudged, was that I think they had this idea that what people were really animated about was national identity mm. yeah. and was some type of patriotism. When actually the kind of town halls I was visiting, the conversations that many of us in the, the Yes campaign were, were having, that question of identity was very much subordinate to issues of democracy, mm -hmm. issues of um, what do we think welfare should look like? How do we how do we organise our society and what our principles are doing? So but all these sorts of issues, uh, you know, what Scotland's role in the world geopolitically, um, and I think that 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 was misjudged by by Labour. And actually, even to this day, I don't think they quite understand what mm -hmm. happened in twenty fourteen. Um, where where to get hope from today? I think when you've got um, you know, whatever happened in 2014, maybe hope taken away from, from a lot of people. And then since then, you've had a whole series of events as well, which which haven't been on the side, I would say, of, you know, hopeful breakthroughs. Um, but I think that, you know, one of the ways that you have to get towards some kind of um, energy, some kind of positive energy, is you have to start from where reality is mm -hmm. and try and build from there. Yeah. And one of the things that, I've been keen to do is not to be too whimsical about 2014, not to be too reliant on those memories, good as they are, and certainly not attempt to reanimate the conditions of 2014, which don't exist today. We need new thinking. Mm -hmm. We need new approaches. Um, and that will include uh, people reaching across the constitutional uh, divide um, and to engage in a discussion about where there are things that we can do right now in Scotland. And there's a lot we can do right now with the existing powers. Yeah. Uh, and there's a lot that we could be campaigning for. Um, and that's, I suppose, where my my focus is now, rather than on channeling everything through the national question, important as it is. One of the things that I've found the most frustrating, especially around the, this 10th anniversary, is the Yes campaign's focus on, are you yes yet? Because for me, that is a really patronising way to ask a question. 
People talk about this being a 50-50 divide. It's not. There are around 50% of the population want independence. I suspect, from what I've read, around 20% are never going to want independence. But there's a whole bunch of people in the other 30 that are open to that. And for me, I'm absolutely with you on that, Jonathan. We need to stop talking about whether we're yes or no. We fought for a parliament to do a whole range of things that it has the powers to do and has not done. And for me, whatever choice we're going to make, we need to start building that democratic muscle. We need to start saying, yes, there are things Westminster aren't willing to let us do, but there are all sorts of things, whether that's around the work we're doing around proper local government, whether it's about land reform or taxation, and start having those conversations across the divide. And for me, and I always forget the expression, but for once it's come to me, losers consent. The no side did not cover themselves in glory. They won and they forgot about losers' consent. And both Tory and Labour governments in London seem to forget that half the population, and if the figures are to be believed, 75% of the under 35s want independence. And that's not, I'm absolutely with you, that's not about national identity or any of that. It's about wanting to be in control of their own lives. Then to be so dismissive... And they also completely tie, you know, dismissing the SNP, which is disrespectful given they're a, they're a directly elected government. But even, you know, lay that aside, this is not about the SNP. And I think the other thing that Labour have made a big mistake around is assuming that it is a Labour SNP divide. The evidence suggests 30% of Labour voters voted for independence. And yet they're frightened to say so. Candidates have been deselected because they supported even just a referendum. I was a member of the Labour Party for 20 years. I thought we were a part of they, because I'm not now. I thought they were a party committed to democracy. Well, if that's the case, how can you possibly think it's OK not to allow people that vote for you or are members of your party to have a view that's different about the future of the United Kingdom? And for me, you know, that's just insane. And, you know, where does hope come from? I think, first of all, Jonathan's right. We need to just get on and start doing the things in Scotland and pushing the government, whatever colour it is in Holyrood, to, to use the powers it's got much more boldly than they've done and much more collaboratively, because that constitutional divide is just as awful in the Parliament as it's everywhere else. But I think also we have to start making a case for Westminster to change its position. Because I think Westminster will be the breaker of the union because I think Ireland and Wales and Scotland are fed up being treated as second class mm -hmm. citizens, which is how it feels. You know, mm -hmm. Scotland's very convenient when we've got oil or we've got wind power, but you know, or water even. But when we want to do something that they don't like, whoever they are, and they just don't get Scotland. And mm -hmm. I am astonished that I think 37 Labour MPs don't seem to get Scotland either and are dis disrespectful of the voting public, not just of the SNP. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Gosh, I, I wasn't expecting a... to be quite as... Um, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. But it's uh, true. But it came out. Um, I think there's a really interesting link there between the building back up of hope and the, I guess, addressing this sense that the Scottish Parliament has kind of labelled itself as impotent for a political mm -hmm. point. Yeah. Um, and and tackling that and I, I guess one of the other questions I wanted to ask you both what does the legacy of the referendum tell us about the political structure and culture in Scotland particularly the relationship between the formal politics of Scotland and the informal and that vertical, vertical horizontal divide that was so clear in the independence movement in the SNP um, and where we are now is kind of it's a very different relationship and has at the time has been very antagonistic. Mm. Um, so yeah, how do you, how do you see that legacy? Um, what do you see the, the, what does that legacy tell us about the political culture of Scotland and also where do we go from here? <laughs> how do we build back up a formal politics that pays attention to, to the horizontal as well? I think, you know, so much depended on, and this is an obvious point, but so much depended on the outcome of the vote. I think had you had a yes vote, you would have had a very different set of political coordinates to navigate mm -hmm. about where Scottish politics went. Many more opportunities, I think, would have would have emerged. Uh, with the no vote, a lot of the energy and the 
activism and the feeling that was involved in the Yes campaign almost moved in regiment form, uh, not just to vote SNP, but actually to join Mm -hmm. the SNP. So they have an extra 100,000 or so people that that join. It's a huge number of people, become very dominant electorally and so on. And I think it was at that point, and because of the no vote and people feeling that they need to somehow look for another opportunity to experience a 2014 type agency and come to a different conclusion this time, one which is pro-independence, I think it did mean that the movement lost something. Mm -hmm. I think it lost its irreverence. I think it lost its um, uh, its plurality in terms mm-hmm. of the political mix that was involved. Yeah. And what instead we got was something far more deferential, something far more about we have to put our faith, not even just in a party, but in a person, mm-hmm. uh, a person being Nicola uh, Sturgeon. And then from an SNP perspective, they were very skillful about this as well, because for them, this is quite good. Here we have this huge base of people, money, activism, votes. We have this popular leader, uh, which can transmit the kind of hopes of this movement and so on. Um, but of course, at the same time as that, you had a sort of high degree of centralization mm-hmm. taking place, where sort of policy was very outsourced, um, decision making, as I say, very centralized and so on. And therefore, I think the legacy of what we could have had this brilliant legacy, you know, we could have had this big experiment in mass democracy. We could have had this um, this idea of you know a pioneering SNP when it came to mm-hmm. reform, uh, and there weren't many sweeping reforms that were truly transformed. If there were a couple of things, but but not big kind of set piece things that you might expect. And I have to say as well that you know, ten years on, there's been a couple of um, sort of anniversary events, different types, but not many. Uh, and it's not the case, for example, that there's been a, any real cultural, for example, uh, memorialization of, of 2014. There hasn't been some concert or something where, you know, people came together and whatever, you know. I think there is a real feeling that uh, maybe 2014 was our chance, actually. Uh, for those of us that are pro-independence and that now 10 years on we have to be very honest and realistic about what the balance of forces is today and and how best to to lead those into what what I would regard anyway as being uh, as being progressive progressive ideas in Scotland right uh, and this is a bit there'll be a debate about what those even are right yeah. but but I think you know for me that's that involves questions of class of democracy yeah. of power. Yeah. Uh, and of and of political agents agency, and um, you know we have to think creatively about how we resuscitate that. I think. Yeah, I was pretty horrified to see over the last couple of days Irvin Welsh being quoted as saying, "You know, 2014 was a disaster, and more or less Scotland's finished." Um, I suspect he doesn't live here anymore because I, for one, don't believe for a minute Scotland's finished, and I think there's lots of hope. I think to address your first point. Lena, about the political, the formal political structures. When I was touring the country pitching the Parliament scheme in, in ni- the late 90s, before the 97 referendum, one of the views was that the PR system for the, local, for the Parliament would change the party political structure in Scotland. And of course, we did for a short time have what we called a rainbow Parliament with the, the SSP and the Greens and the woman that was the hospital candidate and the older People's Party and all of that. But that didn't last very long. When I was doing um, various events about what the 2014 referendum might mean, one of the points I was always astonished, and and it was an STUC conference, I was in a fringe meeting, and I think it was the Fire Brigades Union had just come out in favour of independence in Scotland, much to the horror of the the London counterparts. Um, So it was a fairly topical conversation. And I was astonished to think, to hear people working on the assumption that a vote for independence was a vote for SNP government. Till I pointed out that, you know, if you vote for independence, there will then be a transition, which the SNP government would lead, and then there will be elections. And I've often said, um, and I'll come back to the Conservatives in a minute, I've often said the best, and I still believe, the best hope for the Labour Party is actually independence in Scotland. Um, They may think they've done really well in this election. I'll be really curious to see how well they do in 2026 because I'm afraid 34% does not warrant a huge swing to Labour. For me, it's a huge vote against the Conservative government, and I think that's what they did so well with. 
the Conservatives I find fascinating because Murdo Fraser's often run um, articles about how he believes there should be a separate Scottish Conservative Party. And I just can't quite reconcile in my head how a Conservative and Unionist can say we need a separate party, but we don't need a separate country. Those two things seem completely contradictory to me. So I think there is an issue about political structures and political parties. And you're absolutely right, Jonathan. If Yes had won, the SNP could have done amazing things and the other parties would have had to rise to the challenge. But I do think it's about democracy and power. And I think that is going to come from the bottom up. It's going to come from the younger generation. It's going to come from if we manage to persuade all the parties to come together to reform local government, because I think that's where we need to start. And also to put the pressure on for them to force the parliament. And we really mean the government, but the parliament should be forcing the government to be far more radical and give people hope in Scotland with the powers we've currently got and then see how people feel. I, for one, would love to think we would get a Westminster through PR that would have a coalition government that would realise that the only thing they can do is give their power away and focus on the things that really need doing at Westminster and let the nations and the regions get on and do the things that matter. I have no great hope because somehow people get into that Westminster bubble and suddenly they want to keep all the power to themselves, whichever party they come from. Um, so, you know, I, I, I firmly believe that it's not if independence comes. I think it will because I think the trend is coming that way. And, the, if, you know, if the younger generation continue the way it looks, there will be a trend that a Westminster government could not resist. They could not refuse. But we need to build hope from the bottom with the powers we've got right now and re-engage people in believing they can have some say over their own futures in the current situation. Because I'm with Jonathan, there's not a referendum on the horizon in the next five to ten years. No. Um, <laughs> did, I do have any view if there were unexpected um, long-term implications or consequences of the referendum, so things that you can sit back and look at the last 10 years and think, didn't see that coming out of 2014. Brexit. <laughs> I think that's the single biggest one. Yeah. And waking up the morning after the referendum, after all of David Cameron's kind words, and the first thing he talks about is English votes for English laws. And I just, I just remember thinking... He doesn't get it either. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think Brexit is the thing that's changed the whole debate and has contributed to that sense of hopelessness. But again, is what young people are rightly, you know, not fixated on, but are much more interested in. And I find it simply unimaginable that Keir Starmer is saying no to joining the Erasmus scheme or to a youth mobility scheme with Europe. You know, I find it unthinkable that he'll not reverse Brexit, but lay that aside. Even if I accept that, there is so much he could do that would give our young people hope and give them the opportunities, them, you, the opportunities that we had when we were your age. Um, and I just can't get my head around why he's taken that position at all. One of the things that um, I certainly wouldn't have expected or predicted um, that took place in the years following the referendum was the developments in the Labour Party, uh, the development of, for example, Jeremy Corbyn's leadership. This is something which um, I think, you know, for me, certainly um, not exactly coming out like a bolt out of the blue, because there are a set of conditions there which you can imagine, you know, this, this happening. But um, my view of the Labour Party in 2014 was that it was very much on a completely different trajectory, that the idea of a Labour left or a, or a left-wing Labour leadership was 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 over, was was a kind of incomprehensible idea. Now, that was proven completely wrong, of course, right? Um, at the same time, uh, the kind of general kind of analysis about the British state, about the its associated institutions and so on, about how these can be barriers to these kinds of developments, um, was also made clear. So um, here you have a kind of, uh, there's a lot of things that happen in the last 10 years, which will take some time to digest. And one of the things, and I'm talking here from a pro-independence perspective, one of the things that a defeat allows you to do is to take some time and to have some serious analysis about what happened and about what the situation is to date. 
because you're not under the conditions of you know you're having to constantly deliver something or build something you actually have to sit down and think through okay what's just happened and i don't think there's been enough of that actually across the independence movement about uh you know we're caught i think so many people have been constantly seeking that next available opportunity you know to 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 reanimate the sense of uh, energy that they had in 2014 and that's completely understandable but at some point you've kind of got to say well what is the what are the actual circumstances what are the dynamics how should you intervene um, and I think as I say there's there's lots of ways that you can do that in Scotland um, and uh, you know things like things like Brexit as well are interesting because um, one of the things that you have to to also consider is that lots of people who voted yes did actually also vote leave. <laughs> you know, there's, yeah. there's a lot of different things going on there <laughs> that you have to say uh, as well. I mean, lastly, Lena, in terms of some of the the programmatic issues, I mean, it's very it's it's impossible actually to become an EU member unless you've got your own independently run Correct. central bank in yeah. currency, for example. That kind of jars with the SNP's perspectives around an indefinite form of what's known as sterilisation, where the Bank of England retain monetary control. So there are big issues, you know, there are big, big questions, which, are, in my opinion, are unanswered, despite it being 10 years later from, from 2014. So lots of changes, but lots of questions, I think. And for me, I think that's really hit the nail on the head, Jonathan. And actually, political parties never do that kind of analysis of why did we lose? No. You know, and I think that's a really critical point. And if Labour had done that analysis in 2007 when Alex Salmond won the election, I think they'd have behaved very differently. And I think you're right. I think there was a whole raft of people jumped to conclusions about why you the, the independence side lost in 2014. Oh, it was the vow. Oh, it was Gordon Brown. There were issues around currency for sure in some of the discussions I was having. And to me, if you're going to be independent, you have to have your own currency. That's a no-brainer. So I understood why people felt that was odd. But also the whole bit about people being told they would lose their pensions. We really needed an analysis of mm -hmm. why people voted the way they did and what were the issues that stopped them voting the other way. But coming back to your point about Jeremy Corbyn, it really follows on from what I said earlier. At a UK level as well as at a Scottish level, I don't understand how we still have a Labour Party and a Conservative Party. Because to me, Labour is at least two parties and so is the Conservative Party. I was reading yeah. Dominic Grieve this morning, you know, a really decent Conservative Minister and Attorney General and all of that. And the man is in despair about his party because they've swung so far right. Mm -hmm. And the same is true in Labour. So many Labour voters absolutely disheartened within, you know, less than three months of an election, beginning to think that this party is so far to the right of them in government, which was not what they expected. And I think the same is true in Scotland. And I really did think there would be a real alignment of political okay. parties. And I was astonished. If it's right, I, and I, you know, you can't believe everything you read. Anna Sarwar saying yesterday, I don't I'm not interested in party membership numbers. I'm interested in voters. What does that say to his members? Why would anybody join? And whilst I was still a member of the Labour Party 20 years ago, Gordon Brown, as Chancellor, was pushing to get Labour to a million members in the UK. Nobody would even think about trying that. Party political membership, even with the SNP's huge swing. And even though they've lost, they're at about 60,000. I suspect we've got fewer than 100,000 people in Scotland that are members of any party. That tells you something about the party system and that needs reforming. Um, and for me, it would be a bold politician that decided to say, actually, we should have two separate parties in Labour and we should have two separate parties in, in the Conservatives that would much more reflect the people that vote for them. Um, and, you know, the Tories are at risk, of course, with reform. One point, if I may, just on the parties and party membership was about the idea that mass party membership was seen as something of the past, um, that, you know, big parties with, you know, hundreds of thousands of people and so on. Um, but there is a relationship between movements and parties in that sense, so that the independence movement uh, translates to a, a mass membership party yep. in the SNP. Similarly, a lot of the movements that had emerged around Jeremy Corbyn's Labour um, translated to that party becoming 
several hundreds of thousands strong. So that yep. there are relationships between these things, which again, I think lots of people uh, would not have predicted um, uh, previously. Yeah. Um, is there anything else you want to kind of do in terms of closing remarks? Anything you want to say on the 10th anniversary or what you want next? <laughs> what do you want to look at? Um, what do you wish people talked about when they talked about 2014 and, and where we are now? And well, I'll go first we'll and close. say I wish we'd just stopped talking about 2014 altogether. <laughs> and let's just start talking about Scotland, where we are now and where we want to get to in the broadest sense. Yep. Um, the constitutional issue will obviously be a part of that, but I'd like to think that we can cross that constitutional divide and start working together to use what we've got right now for a better Scotland. Yeah, and for, for me, I mean, I, I agree with, with much of that, Esther. Um, I suppose my only comment would be that the stakes are extremely high. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the political, economic, social, environmental questions are so huge. And, and what's important about it is all of these things are happening at the same time, that it's not just one particular crisis on one front, but actually there are so many. Um, and that is going to require serious leadership, uh, real thought um, and, and real determination, actually, to overcome a lot of those challenges. And, uh, and on that basis, I think we have to take the best from 2014 in the Scottish context, but apply it to new circumstances. Yeah. yeah. All right, thank you very much both. Right. I think the only thing I would add there is the key word for me about that, that leadership yeah. is it needs yes. to be collaborative leadership. Yeah. And we're not getting that at the moment in Scotland. We really need it. Yeah. On that extremely compassing note. <laughs>